probably is a good place for an astronomy talk. A lot of good astronomy goes on in the pub setting during meetings, so this is an appropriate location. And uh, today I'll talk, be talking to you a little bit about uh, some research that myself and a lot of other astronomers are doing to uh, locate planets outside of our own solar system. And uh, I'll be talking about, hopefully by the end of this talk, you can uh, see this uh, or understand this uh, image a little bit better. I'll start off with history, which the younger folks won't understand. Um, but if you rewind yourself back to 1994, um, it was notable for a few reasons. I would think the most important is that the Commodore Computer Company, makers of the famous Commodore 64 and Commodore 128, uh, unfortunately went under. They went bankrupt. Um, a second notable thing that happened in 94 was that uh, we only knew of planets that were located inside of our own solar system. And also there were nine. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> That'll be a question and answer session, fun. <laughs> um, so 1995, I would say, it was kind of, uh, kind of a revolution in astronomy um, in that we kind of detected the first uh, planets outside of our own solar system. And um, this, was this, uh, this process began in the early 90s uh, when astronomers started looking at uh, a large body of nearby stars, look for optics around them. Um, and they used two basic techniques to find basically most of the planets we know today. Um, and these two techniques were notable in that they were sensitive to older planets kind of located nearby their host stars. So the first technique is called the radial velocity technique. And if I don't close my program, I might have a little animation. So this animation is showing that if you're here sitting with a telescope and observing uh, a star located relatively close by the Earth, um, and looking at the light from that star, if there's no planet around that star, you'll just measure a star's spectrum or its chemical signature. If there is a planet orbiting around your central star, it's going to cause the motion, it's going to cause that star effectively to wobble in space due to gravity. So gravity is going to push and pull on your central star, and that's going to imprint a signature or a, or a Doppler effect uh, on, the, on the star's spectrum. So if you observe a star's spectrum and you see that spectrum repeatedly getting red-shifted and blue-shifted uh, with a set period, uh, that is one piece of evidence that astronomers use to tell that, ha, that star might have a planet around it. Okay, and that's the radial velocity technique, and that technique has discovered several hundred planets to date. Another popular technique is called transit photometry. And transit photometry is really simple. You just observe the brightness of nearby stars and record that brightness as a function of time. And if there's no planet around that star, in general, the, the brightness of the star should just be constant in time. But what happens if you have a planet which is orbiting the star and crosses in front of the star? Well, when that planet exactly crosses the edge of the star, you're going to record less light from the star itself. The planet is going to block out light from your central host star. Um, this is called a transit, and if you observe this periodic dipping, this periodic uh, removal of light from the system, this periodic diminishing, diminishing thank you, dipping, oh my gosh, uh, a periodic uh, diminishing of light from your central star, you can go, aha, there's probably an exoplanet around, this, uh, around the system. So putting uh, things into table format as a function of year. Again, 1994 was sad. We had nine planets in our solar system, no exoplanets. The first exoplanet was discovered in 1995. And I want to call your attention to uh, 2011, where if you can see this number down here, there's over 530 exoplanets known to date. And the number is literally increasing several per week. It's, as someone in the field, it's hard to keep up with. Um, so this number is probably even a little bit out of date. It's probably about 550 or so. Um, so yeah, basically, I mean, when I started my undergrad, this field didn't really exist much, and all of a sudden, I'm in it. So it's a pretty exciting place to be. Okay, and if you study some of the basic properties of those 530 planets that are known outside of our solar system, and look at uh, the number of those planets as a function of distance from their host star in, in, uh, in terms of days. So 
on Earth, you know, a year, 365 days would be right here. So most of the planets that we know around other stars are orbiting on relatively short orbital periods. So a year is, is relatively short for these planets. Okay, so the two main techniques, the radial velocity technique and the transit technique, have really been successful at detecting, um, at detecting older planets that are located really close to their host stars. I mean, a, a question one might have is, well, what, what is the population of, of younger stars which are located further away from their host stars? And unfortunately, we don't know much about how many young planets there are outside of our solar system and how young planets form, uh, because you can't detect young planets with the radial velocity technique or with transit surveys. You need to use some other technique, and it's pretty good that that's what I'll be talking to you now about. <laughs> Um, so, just as a, as a very brief review about how stars form and how planets form, uh, we think that stars form from the collapse of a cold uh, cloud of gas in space uh, uh, via gravity, and that cold cloud slowly condenses into a central object, a central protostar, a young forming object, and material is guided onto that young forming star by a circumstellar disk. So. It really is kind of like almost a pancake-like disk where mater material travels from the outer part of the disk and is accreted or, or accumulated onto the central protostar. So that is how a planet forms. That's how a star forms, my gosh. Um, and we think planets form from the residual material in that natal star formation disk. Okay, so young planets form from the remnants of star formation material. The number is pretty small. The numbers are pretty small. It generally takes about um, uh, roughly uh, three to ten million years or so to create uh, the, these first planets before your disk of gas and dust dissipates. Okay, so how do we find young planets then? Uh, well, one way to find young planets is to, is to try to image and study these young disks where they form. Okay, and what specifically are we looking for when we're imaging these young disks? Uh, what we're looking for are, are morphological features, or um, yeah, features is another is a probably a better word without terminology. Um, so features such as as clumps or warps in your disk, if your disk has a gap in it, or maybe an inner hole, or even a spiral structure. All of these different types of features are thought to be uh, created by gravitational interactions between a forming planet and the gas and dust out of which it's forming. Okay, so this last point is kind of a bullet point take home summary that if you observe features in a disk, um, there's a good chance that this is a smoking gun that you're observing a young planet which has either recently formed or is in the process of forming. Okay, so look for a disk structure. If you see it, that's probably where a planet is forming or nearby where a planet is forming. Okay, so we want to observe features in disks. Um, of course, this is not easy. Um, really, the challenge for this whole process is listed right here, and it's a matter of contrast. Um, and the analogy that I think is appropriate is that trying to image a planet or trying to image a disk, it's like trying to image a candle that's placed right next to the sun. <laughs> it's hard to do because the sun is a lot brighter than a candle. And if the candle is really close to the sun, it's hard to tell the difference between the two. Uh, so the process that you need to do uh, to observe this candle or to observe this planet is to block out the light from your central star somehow. Okay, and not only do you want to block out the light from your central star, but you also want to do this as close to the star as possible. You want to image right that candle placed right next to your central star. To do this, calling on the Simpsons, we go to Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 1. That's probably a copyright infringement, but sorry, <laughs> KCTS. Um, again, I'm dating myself because this was like, I think, 10, 10 or 15 years ago. But in Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 1, Mr. Burns blocked out the light from the sun using a big occulter, a big disc, and physically raised that up and blocked light from the sun and made Springfield dark. And everybody was sad. Astronomers do the same thing to block out light from nearby stars to try and image planets and disks around them. 
And in fact, this panel right here is showing you what happens when we place one of these occulters in front of a nearby star. This is uh, a nearby star with a disk that's placed behind an occulter uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. And most of what you see here is light which is diffracted off of this occulting wedge. So there's a lot of noise present there. So what people do is then immediately observe a star which we don't think has a planet or a disk around it with the same instrument, with the same chronograph, the same occulting spot that's shown in this middle panel. And if you subtract out this middle panel from the top panel, you get this awesome looking thing on the bottom where that is where the central star used to be and you get this nice triple spiral circumstellar disk present. So it's pretty graphical, so it's easy to tell when you're doing things horribly wrong and horribly right. Um, and it's difficult, but it can be done. Okay, um, in my last few minutes, uh, just a few quick examples. Uh, the star on the left here, this image on the left, is an image of a star slightly more massive than the sun called Fomalhaut. Uh, the star used to be right there. It was placed behind one of these occulting wedges, occulting uh, bars, uh, blocking out light from the star. And what was revealed was this Sauron-looking Lord of the Rings ring, <laughs> which was pretty cool because you image the circumstellar disk. Um, but there are some really other important features about this disk. One is that the, the center part of the disk was right there, whereas the star location was right there. So the ring was offset from the centroid position, the central location of the star. There was this offset. One of the ways you can produce this offset is by if you have a planet located somewhere inside of the ring, which is gravitationally interacting with the dust in the ring and causing it to be slightly offset from the star. Okay, so these observations were made in 2005, and the prediction was that there must be some type of planet located inside of the ring. And in 2005, we didn't see it. Fast forward to 2008, and astronomers reobserved this ring. And it's hard to see, but if you blew up this little section of the ring, you see two dots. In 2004, you saw a dot, which was right here, or roughly right there in the image. And two years later, that dot had moved. So it's in another observation was made of the system, and it was found that these dots actually keep on moving in a circle, in, in an orbit around the central star. So this is thought to be, or generally accepted to be, one of the first images, actual images, of a planet outside of our solar system. So that dot of light is thought to be a planet. Pretty cool. Uh, another such example of this, uh, and this will be the last one I'll go over since we're running a little bit over on, on time, is the Beta Pick system. This is a, another star which is slightly older than the, uh, slightly more massive than the sun, my mistake. And its disk is, is oriented edge on, so, yeah. So the disk is oriented edge on, so you're like looking through the edge of a pancake. And if you look at the disk, the central star used to be right here, and again, it was blocked out with a chronograph. This is the disk. And hopefully everybody can see this little butterfly morphology in the inner disk region, this little clump going up and this little clump going down. So that butterfly morphology was thought to be caused by uh, a planet located somewhere inside of here, which was gravitationally interacting with gas and dust in the system and essentially lifting material out of the equator of the disk. So astronomers saw this image in, in 2000 and said, aha, there's some neat structure there. We think that's caused by gravitational interactions with the planet and dust and gas in the system. And since I'm mentioning the system, there must be a planet there, right? And in fact, in 2009, a planet was in fact imaged right there. A few years earlier, in fact, that same planet was imaged on the other side of the star. So we do know that that is tracing out an actual orbit around the central star. So this is, I think, probably thought to be about the fourth planet that's imaged. Planets two, three, four, and now six are from the HR8799 system, just a nearby star. The nearby star used to be right there. And this is the first exoplanetary system that's been observed, that's been imaged. There are planets 
B, C, D, and E. Um, and the scale of this is roughly, it's similar to the size of, of, uh, of our solar system, with this little bar being 20 AU. So this is roughly the, the, the distance from the Earth to roughly Neptune-ish. Pretty cool. So I'll leave it there. There's a bunch of other cool disks I can show if you'd, if you'd like later, including this little, I don't know, this is an awesome little thing. It looks like a little mini Godzilla with a head and arms and a tail. Uh, I was a part of that one. It's really cool. Um, but, but a summary is that we now have, know of more than 500 planets outside of our own solar system. Uh, if we want to look for the young ones, which are in the process of forming, uh, a good way to do this is to try to image uh, circumstellar disks around nearby stars and look for features. Thanks. Thank you, John. I'm just going to stand back here instead of trying to shimmy past everybody again. So <laughs> if everyone wants to turn, if you care to look, you don't have to. You can just listen. The spiel on the... All right. So, uh, so if you have a question, if you could raise your hand, and then Darren or Stephanie will come and bring you the mic. The reason we're doing that is just so that we can record the questions uh, so that we can hear them back uh, on the video. So with that, we have a first question. Is this... Uh this technique you have seems to depend on the quality of the, con of the control star. And I was just wondering if you have multiple control stars and uh, if you account for the fact, or do, do you uh, account for the, do you try to take a control star that has the same class of, same class as the star that you're looking at? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, the question was about the, uh, the control star used to, to uh, image uh, disks or planets. And uh, there actually is a, a, a lot of work that goes into identifying uh, appropriate control stars to use. Uh, you want to avoid anything which is known to have a planet around it or anything which is known to have a disk around it um, or potentially could have a planet or potentially could have a disk. Uh, it also should be nearby uh, and nearby to the star that you're looking at. Uh, a similar mass range, a similar temperature, a similar age. Uh, not known to have a binary companion or a tertiary companion. Um, not known to be a variable star. So it has to be as vanilla and plain as possible. And finding those is actually pretty hard because there's, yeah, there, there's a lot of stars out there. And you'd think that we know a lot of things about a lot of stars, but we know a lot of things about a few stars. So <laughs> it's difficult. And when you choose an, in a, an inappropriate comparison star, um, this process will not work well at all, and basically you'll get all noise and no disk or no planet. Um, if you, sure. So you can do you confirm it by changing the control star? So if you see one thing with control star A and you do control star B, you see the you see the same thing. It's a good bet. Uh, yeah, the, the two ways that you can confirm a detection is, is one, you can use uh, different control stars. Um, or another thing you can do is to, uh, to rotate, if you're using the Hubble Space Telescope, just rotate the entire Hubble Space Telescope or rotate your instrument uh, on the back of a telescope. And if you observe the same structure, uh, the same structure, this same disk structure at, at different roll angles of Hubble, essentially, that, that's uh, a confirmation that what you're seeing is not an artifact. Uh, how big is the the occulting bar or wh whatever it is that you're using to block out the star? Right. So um, th there are different uh, different types of of uh, occulting masks you can use. Um, the ones that are most commonly used are actually in the in the instrument uh, camera itself. Uh, so the occulting mask is, is of order diameter you know, of millimeters to, to micron. So it's very very small. Um, there are thoughts for and these are actually serious thoughts. This isn't made up. Um, uh, for next generation powerful coronagraphs to image uh, nearby stars, which use a free-flying occulting shade with another telescope in space. So a free-flying occulting shade is essentially, literally, one of these kilometer-sized huge disks, which are free-flying in space with complicated petal structures. And basically, they're powered around to different stars and used to block out light from different stars. 
that hasn't been launched yet, but it's one of the leading contenders for a next generation planet imaging program. How far away is the nearest star around which uh, a planet or planets have been confirmed? And what's the current estimate of the number of uh, planets in our uh, galaxy? And finally, since you just mentioned the Hubble Space Telescope, tell us about uh, the next uh, space telescope. Sure, sure, sure. So starting with the first question about uh, the nearest uh, planets outside of our so solar system, uh, I in general, uh, an order of uh, five to ten light years away. So it goes from being really close all the way, you know, for the most part, out to uh, several hundred light years. That's usually the, the range that people are looking over. There are a few oddballs, so to say, which are located really far away, but those are from techniques that I didn't discuss today. Um, I remember the third question. What was the second? The no, sorry, yeah, yeah, uh, right. Uh, so the second question was, what is the number of exoplanets that, that are known to date in our galaxy? Estimated, right. Um, so there's roughly 530 confirmed exoplanets. Um, uh, there's a spacecraft in orbit right now looking at transit photometry called the Kepler satellite. It's looking at a region of the sky uh, towards Cygnus, and it has identified a pool of over 1,000 candidate objects, candidate planets. I think it's 1,200-ish candidate uh, planets, um, and the Kepler scientists are in the process of confirming each of those. Um, it's expected that most probably will be confirmed as as uh, as exoplanets. Um, the survey itself, I think, is a, a three to four year survey, and they're just in the first year or two. Um, so that 500 number that I quoted will probably triple in the next three years or so, at least. Um, and then the third question was about, uh, so I talked a little bit about the Hubble Space Telescope, which produced uh, that image right there and produced th these planet images and produced these awesome disk images. Uh, the next major space telescope planned is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's currently in uh, development phase. They're building instruments and the spacecraft uh, itself. Um, it's been in the news recently, as some of you might know. Um, I, I think it's still, well, it's being debated the funding, but I think the House has suggested that the funding for this telescope be cut, um, and it's kind of in negotiation phases right now whether they'll actually restore the funding for that or not. Um, my, all the science that I presented to you today would be greatly benefited um, and driven, new discoveries would be driven by that James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it has a powerful mid-infrared chronograph which would do exactly this science. It'd be much better, much more optimal to actually image nearby planets. Um, so of course, I'm hoping that that decision is, is reversed and funding is restored. If you feel the same way. <laughs> I'm not on company time, so if you feel the same way, write your congressperson, please. Um, both of the methods that you mentioned for figuring out that stars have planets have the assumption that you're in the plane of the orbit of those planets. Can you say anything about statistically how many planets you're missing? Right. So... Um at least, uh, so that is true for, for the transit photometry technique, um, which again is when you're looking at the brightness of a star and looking for a, a host planet passing in front of that star and blocking out light. That does depend on, actually on two things. The first is that the planet is in the same plane, uh, so the planet actually is eclipsing and not going around my head like this. That's going to look great on the tape. Um, <laughs> um, so there, yeah, the, the statistics are you, you need a you know, plus or minus two degree alignment. And, and the planet also has to be located relatively close to its host star. Uh, so it turns out that the radial velocity technique, the first technique that I mentioned, looking at the, the motion um, uh, of a star a a as it is blue shifted towards you and red shifted away from you, 
that actually is sensitive to everything except for an edge-on orientation. So that's actually the opposite effect, that as long as your star isn't eclipsing, as long as your planet isn't eclipsing your central star, you can detect it with the radial velocity technique. So the transit technique only detects things which are eclipsing or passing in front of the star. The radial velocity technique will detect everything else. You actually don't get any uh, any uh, redshift or blue shift when you have an edge on system. Um, and when people are considering the population of planets in our galaxy, uh, in terms of how often do you see a planet around X type of star, they try to take these, uh, these two systematics into account. Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious about um, how the larger planets in these systems are are they favored as opposed to like smaller Earth size compared to a Jupiter-sized planet? Uh, and just to clarify, the the planets which are being imaged. Yes. Yes. Okay. The, so the uh, the planets which are being imaged are are biased in 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 uh, two ways. Um, the first is that um, when you're looking at let me get, actually get to an image and a laser pointer. When you actually are looking at this little dot right here, what you're looking at is thermal emission, thermal heat being radi radiated from that planet. Um, so planets are going to radiate more thermal heat when A, they're younger, and B, when they're more massive. So this technique uh, is more favorable for detecting more massive, younger planets. Um, it gets harder when you get to lower masses, and it gets harder when you get older. Um, there's also a bias or, or difficulty with imaging planets located, for example, as close to the sun as Earth is, uh, uh, really close to the central star. And that's because, first, your, your occulting mask has a fixed size. So if the planet happens to reside inside that occult, occulting mask you're using, well, you can't image it. And also, you do have usually a little bit of residual telescope artifacts, um, scattered light, right next to that occulting mask. Um, the big push in terms of future instrumentations are, is twofold. Uh, the first push for, for new instruments is to operate at a smaller inner working angle. That's horrible jargon. That means that you want to image closer to your central star than you previously can. And the second big push is to increase the contrast that you can achieve. So you can block out more of the central uh, light, more of the light from your central star and image fainter systems, which would be the less massive um, Earth types. Um, to throw out numbers, just for people interested in numbers, current coronagraphs, current instruments like this, can block out basically one part, one part in a million. Uh, to image an exo-Earth, so uh, a direct analogy of the Earth, uh, you need one part, uh, one part in 10 billion. So it's 10 to the minus 10 contrast. Right now we're at 10 to the minus 6-ish. They can do 10 to the minus 10 basically in a lab. So they're getting close, but there's nothing currently operating which can get that. And what is something like Jupiter or Saturn? Um, Jupiter right now, um, I have to catch myself because it depends a lot on the age. Um, uh, a, a young Jupiter is could be detectable with current instrumentation, as long as it's outside of the uh, the fraction artifacts from from your coronagraph. Um, some of the planets uh, that they're observing, some of these guys are 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 uh, eight eight to twelve Jupiter masses. Um, Fomal hot, this planet right here is it's a little bit of an oddball. People think that it might be a really, really young planet, which actually has a circumplanetary disk around it. Um, and that might be making it slightly brighter than it otherwise would be. So I think that mass might be less than a Jupiter mass. Thank you. Thank you.
do do planets tend to form in a plane that's related to the galactic plane? So planets tend to form not necessarily in the in the in the galaxy plane aligned with the galaxy, but at least in the in the plane of the of the disk of gas and dust which it formed out of. So all of those all of these different planes are, can be oriented randomly with respect to the arms of the Milky Way. Uh, but with within the arms of the Milky Way, these are you know, oriented in all different directions. But once you get to a specific system, then planets do tend to, are thought to form at least in the plane. So they're all orbiting, yeah, kind of like all on, on the on the same plane of a compact disk, for example. Uh, there are known planets which orbit out of a plane or have. I should probably instead of using my arms, use a laser pointer, right? Uh, so orbit like this, for example, instead of nicely in the plane, and that's thought to be from a gravitational interaction between two planets, for example. One gives the other a tug and launches uh, the second planet out of the plane. Do you have any hopes of oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, trying to make some of these measurements from Earth, or will they always be space-borne? And the second question is, I thought I heard you say that the exoplanets that you've found so far are very close to Earth, so if it's so, as you go out and out further in space, uh, there's the possibility of seeing thousands, millions, billions of these. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. I'll take these. Uh, I'll try to take these in order. Right. Okay. <laughs> My memory span is going as an astronomer. Um, <laughs> geez. Um, uh, the first question was how many, uh, essentially, how many of these observations are performed from space, and how many, or can you do these from the ground? Um, so, in general, some of the more exquisite images of of uh, disks uh, have been performed using the Hubble Space Telescope, um, and the reason isn't necessarily. Even I'm a heavy, I, I'm a user of the instruments on Hubble, which does this. But the instruments themselves aren't necessarily perfect. Um, uh, the chronographs themselves had a lot of this, uh, scattered light around them. Uh, the one advantage to using Hubble, and it's a really, really strong advantage, is that uh, it's above the Earth's atmosphere. So all of the seeing effects, all the scintillation from the atmosphere and changes in clouds and all that stuff, everything which would change the shape of a star that you're trying to monitor as a function of time, all of that is excluded. So you have a really stable shape of your star. And that allows you to really accurately place it behind uh, an occulting spot and block out light from your central star. That being said, um, you know, the newest new generation of, of these occulters, or these chronographs, uh, are operating from the ground. Um, this image right here was uh, um, obtained from the ground on the VLT telescope, an eight meter telescope in Chile and the southern hemisphere. Um, let's see, uh, this image of a disk with, with a nice inner gap that we think is created by a planet forming um, inside of the gap and clearing out that gap. That was obtained at the Subaru uh, eight meter telescope in Hawaii, a Japanese based telescope. Um, and it's as part of a program which is imaging roughly 500 nearby stars to try and image these disks and, and, and planets uh, that I'm a part of. And, and this crazy creature-like thing um, also was obtained at the Subaru uh, Observatory. Uh, so there are some ground-based facilities which are doing cutting-edge science. Um, and they actually probably will be driving this type of science for the next uh, at least five to 10 years until J JWST launches. Uh, and then the second question was about, um, so I talked about um, that uh, this imaging is really sensitive to planets located to nearby stars, sorry. Um, and the reason that you want to look, um, let's see, yeah, the reason you want to look uh, at nearby stars is it's essentially a projection effect, that if you're looking at a star which is, for example, that far away and you have a fixed occulting size, 
uh, planet which is located right outside of the occulting wedge, essentially, is going to be relatively nearby that, uh, that star. If you place this a thousand parsecs away, if you place the star a thousand parsecs away, and place that same occulting wedge to block out light from a star a thousand parsecs away, the area that's right next to the occulting wedge is probably going to be, you know, 100 or 200 parsecs or light years away from your central star. So the effective working space or discovery space uh, gets much, much, much broader for our faraway stars. And in fact, so far that you don't think that planets actually reside out there. So to image planets around faraway stars, you need a really, really, really tiny occulting spot uh, to probe the region where we think planets actually are around those stars. That being said, you can use the statistics known from nearby stars and extrapolate to the entire neighboring solar system, uh, neighboring part of the galaxy, as we think we'll do. Okay. Um, have you actually gotten spectra from any of the planets that you've imaged? Yes, so this is a good question of whether people have gotten uh, uh, actual spectra from these uh, imaged planets. Um, at the moment, the answer is no. Uh, at the moment, what people are doing are imaging these planets in different filters which, which isolate uh, a large part of, of the spectrum. Uh, for example, this was imaged around, ooh, I won't use technology terminology, it was imaged around five microns or so, which uh, is in the thermal infrared. Um, there are instruments that are coming online actually next year, which have both a coronagraph and, sorry, using terminology, an integral field spectrograph on it. Essentially, it's an occulting spot which then disperses out the light into a spectrum. So very shortly, we will have the capability of placing a coronagraph to block out light from the central star and then having another part of the instrument essentially take a spectrum of that planet at the same time. Um, so literally, it's being commissioned, I think, in 8 to 12 months. That is a good question because it's really hard. Um, um, so, why why are we trying to? Uh, I, I think it's actually a pretty big question of why are we? Why is it important to do this? In a bigger picture, just finding planets outside our own solar system and trying to image them. Um, and I think most people in the field would say that uh, the goal is to find something which looks like Earth. Uh, so to find an, a planet outside of our solar system which has a similar mass and a similar temperature uh, as Earth. And then if we take more observations, like using that uh, integral field spectra, if we take a spectra of the planet, measure its chemistry, uh, we can look for signs that it might have an atmosphere. We look at, can look for signs that it might be habitable, um, look for chloroform in the, in the atmosphere, for example, or the effects of chloroform in the atmosphere. So it's all getting towards trying to find a nearby analogy to the Earth which might be habitable and then might have little things on it which are living. <laughs> I was going to say green men, but I caught myself. Like, oh, <laughs> my gosh. I'm astronomer John Wisniewski says, <laughs> green men on nearby XOR. I think they'd be wearing tie-dye, but there's nothing. Uh, um, <coughs> um, I was wondering why the star, um, when it has the disk around it, why does it shoot stuff out kind of like a black hole? Uh, I mean, like in this image right here, that's kind of um, pointed? No, if you go back, I think it's back. 
Uh, right there. Ah, that's a good question. Um, when you look at the picture right at like there and then the one right there, why does it shoot stuff out like a black hole? Kind of like after it just, you know, sucked up stuff. No, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, that's a really good question. So I said that stars form from the collapse of a cold uh, cloud of, of molecular gas, which is shown here, and eventually it, it kind of forms a spheroidal, a spherical-like clump of stuff, a protostar. And most of the material from this uh, envelope or disk is driven from the outer part of the envelope into the inner disk um, and onto the central protostar. Um, but that process isn't entirely efficient. So not all the material that's at that part of the disk is going to be actually eaten into the star. In fact, some of it is going to be reflected off the poles of the star and shot out in big jets. So yeah, those things are, in fact, jets. And it's because um, uh, the mechanism which is transporting gas from the disk to the star isn't 100% efficient. So maybe 90% of the stuff goes from the disk to the star, and 10% is shot off in these jets. Yeah, and it's the same type of thing you see in a black hole. Hello. Hey. Hi. Uh, I actually have three questions. Um, I hope you remember them. Uh, the first one kind of is a follow-on to this. Uh, why does the all the dust not fall into the star? Uh, why, why is there a disk at all? Um, secondly, um, in the transit method, you said that the, the light of the star dims. How do you know that's a transit and not a variable star? Mm -hmm. And third, uh, the Kepler mission you've talked <coughs> about, does that have any direct impact on your work? Great. Um, OK, so I'll start off with the first question. The first question essentially was, why do, when you're forming a star, why does that material take the form of a disk and not something else? Why doesn't it say it's completely spherical, for example? Um, and the reason why you get, um, in general, a disk forming is that when you have a start off with a cold molecular cloud, it's this really big cold cloud. And because of some small perturbation, any type of perturbation, it will start to rotate. And then when you start rotating something, um, uh, essentially because of the conservation of angular momentum, that'll start to spin up and take the form of a disk. So it's the, the, an the analogy is, oh, I'll do this on camera too, that's great. Uh, the analogy is like a figure skater, right? Who starts off before doing the turns with you know, their arms out like this, and then slowly pulling them in, and as they pull their arms in, they start going faster. And a cold molecular cloud does the same thing. It starts off with a really large radius or diameter. And as it starts to shrink, it'll start to spin up and naturally flatten out into a disk shape. And aided by those jets, which also help carve out. Uh, so I was actually asking why the, why the disk remains. Why does all the material not fall into the central star? Ah, that's a good question. Um, there can be several options. Uh, one is. One is that if you start to form a planet in the inner disk region, that'll clear out an area of, of the disk, and essentially that can help to slow down accretion, especially as the system ages. Uh, also, as your central protostar gets more massive, it's going to essentially turn on. It's going to reach the main sequence and start to fuse uh, hydrogen in its core, um, and that's going to emit a lot more photons, which will essentially eat out the, the disk from the inside out. So it'll essentially evaporate the disk. Um, so those are some of the competing processes, which is why everything just doesn't get dumped onto the central star. Okay, and then the second question. Oh, you're going to have to tell me. About the transit, and how, how would you know it's not a very good uh, I guess, yes, thanks. Um, so yeah, there are uh, a lot of things you have to be careful about when looking at transits uh, to see whether it's caused by a planet or something else. Um, the first thing you can do is to look at the depth of the transit uh, to, ma to make sure that the depth of the effect that you're seeing is not caused by a, a, a binary star, for example. Because um, essentially a planet is really small, so it's going to block out a small portion of the light from the star. If you have another star orbiting your star, that's a huge object. It's going to block out a lot of light. Um, 
you also want to make sure that it's periodic. So typically, transits are observed around a star many, many times, like hundreds of times, thousands of times. Um, and typically, variable stars won't be that repeatable for most normal stars. Um, typically, astronomers also try to avoid looking at classically known variable stars as well. So subclasses which are known to be really periodically variable, in general they try to avoid those just to avoid that situation of having to differentiate because it be does become hard. And then the third question was about Kepler and how does the recent Kepler results affect uh, or, or drive uh, this research. And that actually goes back to the question that was asked um, over here about why are we all doing this. Um, and one of the cool things about the Kepler mission, which again is looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of stars and in and and, and Cygnus, is that it should give us the frequency of exo-Earths from a statistical sense. So it should be able to detect Earth-like planets uh, or super-Earth-like planets orbiting nearby stars. Uh, we're not going to be able to image those because they're really far away. Uh, but we should at least be able to tell how many or how prevalent are these types of super Earth systems around stars in our, in our, in our neighborhood. So that, that was a really big driving point for that mission, and it's a really important question to answer. Given the generality of the process that you describe, and if you could be tempted to go completely off the reservation and make a wild speculation. What is your gut feeling about the prevalence of something that could be described as a planet around your average, you know, second generation star? So in terms of how a ballpark estimate of, of how prevalent are planets? No, what a wild oh, going off the... Going off the deep end? <laughs> Greater than one. Uh, yeah, so I think there, there's, you know, without constraints, I, there's probably a good chance that there is more than one, what we would call a planet around most stars. Uh, most of the... Um, most of the planets that we're detecting, for example, with the transit technique and with the radial velocity technique and with direct imaging is telling us about the gas giant population. Um, and Kepler is going to start to tell us about the rocky planets, things like Earth. Um, and uh, if you look at the, at least the initial distribution of planets being found by Kepler, there seems to be a rise towards smaller planets. So there seem to be more rockier type planets than some of the gas giants. So based on that extrapolation, it's probably, probably I'm, I'm probably not sticking my neck out too far. If I said like 50, that might be far, but uh, there's probably several around each star, I would say. I have a question. Yes. So have you ever discovered a planet? And if so, do you have a planet named after you? <laughs> this is a sad story. Um, <laughs> so the answer is no. Um, there is no John Planet or Wisniewski B or anything like that. Um, but uh, in the introduction, yeah, you mentioned that uh, in my previous life at uh, previous position, I was at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And um, was working with a group that was doing the same type of science, imaging uh, nearby circumstellar disks and looking for planets around them. And uh, my advisor there and his research group um, made this discovery essentially, you know, four or five, six months after I left. <laughs> um, so if I was there for another year or two, I probably would have had a chance to at least work on follow-up observations with the system. Uh, but it was Paul Callas at, at uh, uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Mark Clampin at, at NASA Goddard, who's a JWST observatory project scientist, 
so yeah, they were the the two big players in the system. And oh, if I would have stayed there for another year, maybe you know, at least on follow up. But <laughs> what's the chance for Earth-like conditions supporting life being duplicated elsewhere? Oh, good question. So uh, in general, is the question about what's the likelihood of finding a planet in, in, in a habitable zone, for example. Um, so there were some recent um, uh, press excitement, in fact, from one of the super-Earths that were imaged by Kepler, which uh, probably resides in the habitable zone around one of the Kepler stars. So it, there's at least some thought that there is at least one planet now that we know that's in a habitable zone around another star. Um, and people are really nowadays, um, the focus in kind of 2011 and forward uh, is to look at low mass stars. Uh, so things uh, a tenth or two tenths times the size of the sun called M stars. Um, the reason why these really low mass stars are really exciting is because if you just perform the transit technique um, on these nearby low mass stars, uh, you can actually detect exo-Earths which could lie in the habitable zone around these stars. Uh, just because the central stars are so, so small and low mass, um, and this technique allows you to kind of probe for these types of stars in the habitable zone. So um, there's a big push on the community to try and make those types of detections. Okay. Earth is a, a Sol is a G, G size star, right? Right. And you've just talked about M size. Now, what's the difference between G and M? Yes. Um, uh, so a, a, a G type star is something like our sun. So we kind of, in astronomy, define masses in, in reference to, to our sun. So we say our sun has one, oh, this is an off bad definition, our sun has one solar mass of mass. Um, an M star has a tenth, usually about a tenth of a solar mass of mass. So it's about ten times less massive, roughly, ballpark. And yeah, for as a reference of a, of a M t uh, sorry, of a solar type star with a possible planet forming in it, this system right here is, is a G type star, so it's exactly like our sun. The central star is just like our sun. Um, and this gap, which was just imaged, is shown in cartoon form right here. And again, we think that's caused from a planet located somewhere in here, which is carving out that hole. So G-type stars are good for young planets as well. And just for clarity, when we're seeing this stuff that are a few light years away or hundreds of light years away, to go, if we found a Earth-like planet to try to go there, we may have been, it may have been dead many years ago, correct? Uh, well, we, I think for these types of systems, um, so uh, for for a scale for this, for example, with this being the location of the star, this distance right here is about roughly the distance between uh, the Sun and a little past Neptune. So. Um, and the distance to the star itself is, yeah, probably, that one is probably uh, 200 or 300 light years. So it, it's a while away, but, I mean, 300 light years is better than 3 million light years. You know. um, it wouldn't be possible, you know, with current stuff, but. And John, I have one more question. Yep. How did you get involved in doing this work? And like, what motivates you as a scientist? Um, so the first time I got into was how about the first time I got into astronomy? Is that that's pretty close, right? If I can do that, sure. So I originally started off as a physicist. Somehow, um, I was sitting in a lecture hall at uh, at University of Wisconsin Madison at 
end of my freshman year, at the end of the lecture, the prof was like, this campus observatory has open jobs for observing. And you get paid. Um, all you need is to travel out maybe 10 miles or so, you know, spend a night out there once a week, and you've got a job. So I thought, this sounds awesome. Unfortunately, I didn't have a car. <laughs> um, in spite of that, somehow I tricked them into me <laughs> hiring me, and I ended up taking a bus out to the edge of Madison, Wisconsin, and then taking a cab out from the ed bus stop and ed edge of the bus stop out to the observatory, using coupons that were supposed to be for to combat drunken driving. So it was half <laughs> off cab fare. So I would use that to go out there, then stay there until 6 a.m. in the morning, then take a cab with those drunk driving tickets back to the edge of the city, wait for the first bus, and then go home. And if I worked for more than five hours, I broke even. I was happy. So that was how I got started. <laughs> um, but it worked in the end, so it's pretty cool.